This is the tale you see. Episodic video games are all the rage now. You see it in the recent Hitman game, you see it in everything that Telltale makes, you see it in Half-Life 2 Episode 2, because there's no 3, there will never be. You see it in many, many games in the last couple of years, and you may say to yourself, well, yeah, this is a recent thing, there were no episodic games up until Telltale made them viable and, well, Valve tried to do them with Half-Life Episode 1 and 2. Also around the time EA tried to make episodic games happen with Sim episodes and didn't. But this isn't where episodic games started. People have been trying to make episodic video games for quite a long time. And the first one I ever saw was Siege of Avalon. Created in the year 2000 by Digital Tome, this was an episodic role-playing game. It's one that honestly kind of sort of puts some episodic games a bit to shame. I'm mostly talking about the Telltale ones, but then again this is a completely different animal to an adventure game. This is a full-blown RPG with story, with characters, with combat, with progression, with everything an RPG needs to be good. Now Siege of Avalon wasn't actually that big of a success reasons for which you may see in the background near the end of this trailer that there is uh, another book on the shelf next to Siege of Avalon called Pillars of Avalon. That was supposed to be the sequel but the studio didn't make one, the Shilton never made one because they'll, they, I believe they couldn't. I couldn't find that much information about this studio, I mean it was a long time ago and this wasn't what you'd call a big hit and they didn't make anything else. What I can tell you is that while Digital Tome was working on the concept for Siege of Avalon, they came across a game engine built by a programmer named Steven Davis, who just really liked making games and he wanted to make his own game, but he started out doing the tech first and released that tech to the public, to well, the game developers, and Digital Tome found it, they liked it, and they hired him, and he made the graphics engine for this game. He would then later, and I mean years later, go on to make patches for it so it will run well on modern systems, and I believe is now still trying to get this game re-released and properly working. Uh, you're not gonna see a lot of footage with combat, and I mean proper combat in this show because there is uh, well this happens after a while and I uh, couldn't really get it to work in time to finish uh, doing the recording for the show so uh, the video footage is gonna be stunk mostly with other bits of the game which which is totally fine this game although it has combat in it although it is fine sort of in the same way that the Lion Hearts was actually worse because you don't have a pause option I think combat isn't what you would call the best ever made in a video game it's it's okay it's it's passable it's not the best is what I'm saying. And not having the best combat in an age when Diablo 2 was just being released alongside Baldur's Gate 2, that was kind of a dead sentence for any RPG, so probably that's why uh, CG of Avalon never really took off, but it did actually get six chapters out. The only ones that have uh, like plot development in it uh, are there chapters 1, 2 and 6, with the rest of them being sort of expansions that let you experience more of the world itself Itself, more of the lore, more of the characters, more of the background story. And that's a good thing because what this game did absolutely right in my opinion is setting up a world. This isn't a sprawling game, well what I played of it isn't a gigantic sprawling game This reaches across worlds and countless kingdoms and countless continents. It's a more intimate affair. The first chapter of Siege of Avalon was released for free. You could get it just about everywhere I got mine from a CD from a uh, video games magazine I believe it was level or PC games and I enjoyed what I saw. The tagline of the game, or I believe the tagline of the studio was, have you played any books lately? And the idea upon which the game was built was to create an episodic story, one that you know had gameplay and other stuff, and it did behave a bit like a book. Well, it also looked a bit like a book because you would have very, very beautiful illustrated and written, like it had a very nice font. You'd have a journal, you would have a log, you would have a lot of text in this game. There was a lot of text, and it was good text, maybe not the greatest text ever made, ever written, but it served a purpose of building a world that was believable, a world that was 
endearing. The basic story of the uh, the world is that there is these two races, the human and the Shaul, and they lived for well, probably eons on the same continent without really running into each other because it was a big place and it wasn't all that crowded. But one day it was just through sheer chance that one campfire, one smoky trail in the heavens was spotted by a Shaul raiding party, or maybe scouts, I don't know what they were anymore, and they found humans and they didn't get along and they continued to not get along. And then came the wars, the invasions, the raids, and so Avalon was built, a fortress right at the battlefront, a fortress to keep the enemy at bay. It's a detailed environment. It's full of characters. That, uh, uh, apart from the guards, I believe that each and every one of the characters is named. They don't necessarily have a lot of dialogue and aren't all involved in quests, but they have names. They have unique appearances for the most part, and I'll get to appearances in a jiffy. Something else I can tell you about the story is that I'm not 100% sure which is the right one. And here's what I mean. The chapter one that I played 10 years ago is, well, it is the same in theory as the one you can get now for free on the web, but it doesn't have the same story. It has the same beats to it, but not all of it. Some bits are different. And to be honest, I don't know which one was the pre-released, unfinished, Thing that went nowhere and which one is the official one. It's sort of like the same situation in which you find Divinity Original Sin. That game had three stories. It had one in the beta, one in the release version, and one in the final version. They are different. They have the same themes, same ideas, but they are different. And honestly, I, I kind of like the one in the beta most. It was a bit more you're fighting against the end of the universe, the inevitability of entropy, not against some dragon. But back to Siege of Avalon. The more intimate setting is actually well used as long as you do try and explore it. You do try to get to know the characters, you do try to get a sense for what this game is, namely a narrative vehicle first and foremost. So if you just rush through things and not read a single word, you're not gonna have a good time. It's not that kind of game. It's a wordy game. It's a it's a game where the reading is part of the fun. Understanding what the characters want, what they go through. I mean, this game makes even a simple fetch quest like getting some flowers for Pell to be significant because it's... Well, I honestly kind of forgot why I got her flowers and the sapphire ring at one point. But it's, it's, it's relevant. I assure you, it's absolutely relevant. Also, you can... In, in the, in the uh, updated versions, you can be a monkey in the game. You can only be a male in the base game because you were playing the brother of one of the soldiers that was already there. Now you can play the sister, though the game still calls you the brother, so you are playing a transgender character, technically. Now the reason that getting to know the characters is important and everything is made to feel real, with people moving around, with kitchens, with hospital beds, with endless stories of how Pretty soon we're gonna have to melt down the cookware to make weapons because we're out of them. The reason that's important is because the game builds upon that. It builds upon the... I'm gonna go into a minor spoiler, which again, this is something I don't know if it's actually valid in the final version because I remember there being differences. You're gonna learn that there's a traitor in Avalon. And honestly, when I learned there was a traitor, I just started going nuts a bit. I started suspecting everyone, like, who could it be? Could it be that shifty guy in the corner? Could it be that other guy? Could it be those two guys standing there? It could be everyone. It was a bit like my Call to Mount World 2 did with uh, their... Okay, that, that's an even bigger spoiler answer, so I should probably shut up. What I'm getting at is that the game did something right. No, actually, it, it did two things right. I'm gonna say an opinion that is probably... Well, no, it's not unpopular. Everybody agrees. Clothing in RPGs today is absolute garbage. It's downright insulting. It's been insulting since Oblivion. In Morrowind, you could wear a robe over your armor so you would look like you were incognito. You could look like you were stylish. Since Oblivion, you, you couldn't. You put a robe over your armor, bam, there goes your armor. It's gone, it's unequipped. That's absolute horse manure. And Siege of Avalon makes, honestly, not just every RPG. It makes the Sims look like manure. Because in this game, you could wear baby anything you wanted. You could wear two pairs of pants 
at the same time one over the other. Why would you want to do that? Well, one of them could be armored, the other one could just look good. You could wear, what was, three sets of layers or three or four sets of layers of clothing on your character, like just the chest region. And all those things would show up on your, on your sprite and the result would be just an experience of clothing your character that I haven't seen well again since Morrowind and probably since Daggerfall, which also let you sort of layer things up to a point. It's such a simplistic thing when you think about it, but it makes the game so much more immersive. Then again, you could also carry a rose, a book, and a scroll in a single hand, but it still beats being able to carry only one ring on one hand, like in most other games. Now, you may be seeing that I'm using all sorts of spells on the background from time to time. That's because I actually enabled a sort of cheat in a any file that let me see all the spells because I never saw all of them because I never had the entire version of the game and it didn't progress all that much in level in the first uh, chapter. One of them lets you summon a mouse or well, a rat that you can use to spy on things, which is actually a good thing because, like I said, th this game wasn't necessarily easy. You had three classes. You could be an archer, you could be well, a scout, you could be a warrior, or you could be a mage. And as a mage, you better make sure that you can kill the enemy before they get to you because if they get to you, you're kind of dead. You don't have that much HP. Same thing with a scout. You you don't even have spells that are strong enough to kill things as fast as a mage could. So you're gonna have to be stealthy and probably have some lucky crits. As a warrior you're kind of better off, I mean you are tougher, you're stronger, you can take a few blows and also deal the damage. And you're not alone, though for the majority of chapter 1 I was alone, you will eventually get your own party, your own group of characters that you can take with you on adventures. Adventures through Avalon itself, adventures under it, adventures outside of it in the adjoining towns and in places that are are a lot stranger and in the end I believe you do actually get to confront the leader of the Shaul. The sound by the way was not working in my version of the game even though I tried to patch it it still wasn't available so what you're hearing in the background is music from the game though not from these areas necessarily and or in the order the music should be. Music actually had a tendency to fade in and out in the game for some reason back in the day well, at least in chapter 1 trial for your version the one I had but when it was there it really did help cement the feeling of this game, the mood. One that honestly I believe only Diablo 1 managed to ever emulate in the same way because it too was a more intimate affair and it wasn't meant to be grand, it wasn't meant to have orchestras in it, it wasn't meant to evoke something large but something small, something constrained, something intimate, something close to you, something near you, something touching you from the dark. And it worked, like this game continued to drag me back in, I will be playing that chapter 1 over and over again with each class, each time hoping to get maybe, maybe a sneak peek at something that was gonna happen in the other parts of the Citadel, but I never managed to. The engine itself, by the way, it was described at one time as being one of the best isometric ones ever made. For its time, I mean, it does have the occasional glitch, even when it worked on my old system. Some sprites would not show up with the head, well, I'm guessing it would actually be some mod, well, they weren't models, but they were 3D-ish in nature. But it was kind of abandoned because, as the developer of the engine himself said, this was the age of 3D, no one wanted isometric 2.5 5D anymore. Though we kind of do want it now, so good luck to see even day this with actually getting this game re-released in a functional form, fully updated and compatible with modern systems. Maybe even on GOG, who knows. I have no clue who owns the rights of the game right now. The engine itself is open sourced, though I haven't found files for it on github even though there was a link to github on the official page which is still well, it's not maintained but it's still up though i think there may have been some on sourceforge regardless you can still find chapter one available on the web you can download it it's free and i encourage you to try and play it if it works for you that is the updated versions do get a bit better in terms of usability because uh, when you encounter a transition from one scene to another you don't just go through the transition you have the option of 
traveling to any other place you visited in the game, which speeds up traveling quite a bit, but it may detract a tiny, tiny amount from the joy of experiencing this game, of the locations, of visiting every place again and again, of familiarizing yourself with it, caring about it, and fearing that among you there may be one who wishes to see your downfall. So have fun playing it if you're interested. Honestly, if you like stories, if you like atmospheric RPGs, you won't regret it. Goodbye.